Hello, my name is Dennis. I'm the English pastor at Vinewood CRC, the English ministry of Chinese for Christ Church, Berkeley. And hello, my name is Chris. I'm the English minister for Vinewood CFC, Berkeley. And we want to welcome you to another episode of our podcast, Heard It Through the Grapevine, where we hope to encourage you in your faith and knowledge of God by giving you biblical and theological clarity to your questions about life and faith. And today we have someone that most of y'all would be familiar with if you went to our uh, winter retreat this past, oh, yeah. this past winter. <laughs> we have Pastor Matthew, or we call him Matty Blevins. And uh, Matthew, um, <laughs> Matty, Matty. Uh, <laughs> well, try to combine Mad, Matty and Matthew nice. at the same time. Very good, nice. Lemus. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Hey, why don't you introduce yourself to us a little bit? Okay, Maddie Blevins. Uh, I am uh, pastoring right now at the Japanese Christian Church of Walnut Creek. I was hired here about a year and a half ago. Uh, I shepherd the English-speaking congregation, which is about 80% Japanese. Um, I love the fact that they didn't need to find an Asian pastor, but they were cool with a white guy and so that's why I'm here. Like I said, I've been here about a year and a half and pastoring for about 20 years right now. And i um, blessed to be with you guys. Oh, thank you so much for uh, being here. Maddie has been a mentor and a good friend of mine for a very long time, ever since I've been here. And uh, it's just been a joy having him just walk some things through uh, with me through my life. And so one of the things I've been really uh, kind of, the mem- one of the memories that I really stuck on my mind is that time you took me to San Francisco really teaching me how to Sabbath and rest. And we just took that morning and just uh, went out to San Francisco and grabbed lunch and just took it easy. It was really good. It was really good learning how to just <laughs> quiet down and try how to rest. Breathe. Yeah, that yeah, was fun. Agreed. That was fun. Uh, but yeah, uh, so how, 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 how's your church been doing dur- during uh, Shelter in Place? Maybe you share a little bit about what's been going on. Yeah, you know, um, it's been pretty good here. Uh, you know, we have transitioned pretty seamlessly to uh, pretty much Zoom for our Wednesday nights and our men's groups, women's groups, and youth ministry. Uh, and then on Saturday mornings, we have a kind of guy who's a director here. And so he actually brought in all of his fancy equipment and, and uh, he records the sermons, uh, both Japanese and English, and the worship uh, leaders. Wow. Um, yeah, on Saturday morning. And then uh, we put them online on Sunday and people take a look at it then. Um, We have been blessed, man. Our our Wednesday night Bible studies that I lead, um, we have more and more people. And, and, um, you know, you can't, who who knows about who's watching things. But uh, in general, our congregation seems to be intact, healthy. Um, I am a little concerned about, you know, there's momentum that's lost in spiritual life as we go mm-hmm. through seasons of, of life. And, uh, you know, how do we help people regain that momentum for those of, uh, those of us who have uh, taken a hit, who miss fellowship? And, and um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm working through right now. So it's actually been great. I was working from home up to... Um, week before last until my wife kicked me out was like babe you need to go back to work I guess I was getting a little cranky I was having a hard time because my office was my bedroom so it's just like I can't sleep might as well work on my sermon so work life balance was rough man it was tough and so I started dry I live in Hayward and so it's about 40 minutes away from Walnut Creek and so I get to listen to my favorite podcasts or music and it's totally relaxing I love the drive so Nice. Uh, see, ministry has been great. A uh, year and a half I've been here, like I said, and it's still awesome. It's still amazing. Yeah, that's been really good. Uh, why don't you share with us, how in the world did you end up in a Japanese church? Yeah, I know. I always get asked that question. People like when I tell them, they go, um, is your wife Japanese? No. Do you speak Japanese? No. And they just kind of look at me crazy. Turns out that uh, um, Eric Yada is the senior pastor of the San Lorenzo Japanese church. And I knew him because um, he brought his kids to the um, preschool that was at my previous church. And so one time he just was walking by and I said, hey, Eric, man, I just wanna let you know I'm, I'm moving on from here. 
And he said, there's a church in, in Walnut Creek, a Japanese church that we're hiring. And I was like, I don't know about an ethnic church. I don't know about a small church. I don't know about Walnut Creek. And God had other plans. And so I started uh, filling the pulpit. And then I came in as a transitional pastor. And the Lord led for me to go full time. So yeah, that's how that went. It was oh just covered in providence and the wow. Holy Spirit. I mean, it was, it was truly a, a time of watching the supernatural hand of God hmm. move. It was amazing. I like to think that's that I had a hand in that. Being, Amen. Being an Asian, one of your Asian American friends. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you helped me understand. Although I, I, it was funny. I, I grew up with mostly like Filipinos and Vietnamese. And then I know you and a lot of Chinese churches that I work with. And then I come here and Japanese are very, very different. So <laughs> yes. you know what Vietnamese are Chinese. Chris, yes. Chris oh. married a, you married a Japanese lady. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tamai's Japanese. I love it. That's right. yeah, man. So it's, it's been an incredibly cathartic and healing time hmm. uh, to do ministry. So That's so good. Great. Yeah. Well, we wanted to have you on because just especially a lot of the things that we've talked about previously and something that uh, as we were kind of bouncing back and forth, what really resonated with you, we felt like this might be a really good topic to talk about. So one of the questions that we received from one of our members of the church is in a culture where it is more, much more commonplace to avoid, ignore, or forget quote unquote toxic people, what are some practical ways we can instead love them and i think that's a really great question to ask uh, but before we even get to that question why don't we spend some time defining toxic people and i think you know this can go many different ways and obviously we don't know who submitted this question so we're not really sure exactly what that person means but maybe between the three of us when we hear this term toxic people you know this kind of phrase if, if you end up describing someone or or maybe someone describes you as a toxic person i don't think anyone mm. would what 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 are you thinking of when somebody kind of uses that term i think today it means something different than it did even 10 years ago hmm. um i think today toxic sometimes means people i disagree with or people I don't like, or people who are different from me, or um, people who are um, assertive, you know. Um, but ultimately, when I think of toxic, I think of people who do things that hurt others and kind of keep doing it, don't care. So I think of like bullies. I think of people who are manipulative to try to get their way, I'm very narcissistic, mm. you know, I think of, People who are slanderers, they just constantly talk trash about people uh, or gossips, you know, they just are always, always in someone else's business or, or even like argumentative people who are just, they just love a good argument. And unfortunately, a lot of times that stuff happens in the arena of either social media or um, religion, you know, and so... Uh, you see a lot of that kind of toxic personality come out of like social media about religion or politics. Right. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Chris? What are some of the things that come up to, in your mind when you hear of this idea of toxic person or a toxic person? Yeah, I think um, I'm just looking at this question and, and trying to understand because it says forget toxic people. Um, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with Pastor Maddie that uh, things have changed drastically um, just within a matter of years. I think being in, in college ministry, you see it very prevalent. Mm. Um, it's, uh, and so the way I would define it is just someone who doesn't line up with my views. Mm. <laughs> someone who, like uh, you, you said it, Pastor Maddie, that I don't agree with. And because of that, um, because I don't agree, um, you're not good for me. Mm. Hence, you're toxic. You're poison, right? That that's that that's where you get it, um, and and your beliefs are wrong. And so, uh, and so, really, I think almost at the heart of it, when it comes to toxic people, you it's just people that I don't like. <laughs> I think you can get to that point um, that that aren't uh, in kind of my comfort zone, my sphere of comfort. Um, 
And because it, it makes me uncomfortable, you disappear, go away. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. that uh, it's a moral judgment when you're calling someone toxic. I think there is something as simple as I disagree with you and it's not just I disagree with you, but your position on X, Y, and Z is an immoral position. I think that people would say, and to the extreme where there are definitely people that would uh, try to kind of uh, elevate themselves by pushing other people down. And that may be like another extreme form of people who are quote unquote toxic that kind of like what pastor Maddie was saying, talking, talking, uh, gossiping about people, uh, I, in my mind, I picture people that use other people for their own mm. personal gain with no real regards to the other person. So, you know, I am going to be friends with you as long as I benefit, um, you know, and once I kind of squeeze every last bit of you, eh, you know, I just kind of move on. Uh, but there's definitely a very wide range of thoughts, ideas, definition yeah. of toxic. But I think maybe if we kind of try to narrow it down a little bit, it seems like somebody that... Uh, society or our group of friends or your so-and-so's group of friends have kind of labeled this person for uh, better or worse that, you know, this person is a detriment to me or our group. Mm. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it, it could be a reality, right? Like this person is just like a very mean person, right? <laughs> or, or it could just be, uh, they hold a view completely contrary to mine that makes me just not want to be around them. Yeah. And uh, how many of us have seen those memes that kind of come around every now and then on social media, right? Like, especially it kind of comes around like the end of December, beginning of January, right? <laughs> During those times or like, you know, for my, my New Year's resolution is to cut out all the toxic people in my life. Sure. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I've seen that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe those are some of the things that come to my mind when that happens. So actually, I, I also wanted to chime in. There's, there's one more thing. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of my own congregation and kind of just trying to understand the context of this question, because it says avoid, ignore, or forget, you know, toxic. And it's, uh, we're talking about people who, uh, who may have views, but it's also uh, perhaps um, maybe we're, we're referring to what the individual says that other person's toxic, right? Well, right. it's it's potential that the person actually has no idea that they are <laughs> toxic. Right, um, right, right. Or, or, and we're talking about views, and I'm thinking of a, a specific uh, individual in our church who, who actually um, has uh, some mental challenges, mm-hmm. right, and mental mm-hmm. struggles, and is, is just constantly asking a lot of individuals and people, mm-hmm. and they seem a little uh, awkward or hostile at times, um, and it just becomes draining. And when it becomes draining to the to the one who's, you know, being asked all these questions by this individual, okay, I need to avoid. It's toxic. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. And and I think that, you know, I think it, like you said, Dennis, it's a, it's a wide range of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And especially being uh, a mile south of the campus of UC Berkeley, yeah. being in an evangelical church. I mean, we've seen... Uh, even in a lot of the things that are going on on campus for believers to almost take that posture of, oh, those who are not believers or would hold to certain stances, they're quote unquote toxic. Though they might not say it, but even by kind of their body language or posture, uh, trying to shout down the other person and that we uh, as believers have taken that posture that's no different than the world. Maybe the way that a lot of Mm. uh, non-believers see evangelical Christians, that they see us as, us as toxic. Uh, I think we uh, respond likewise in a way that's no different than culture and society. Um, So I think with that in mind, right? So it could be as simple, like you said, some, somebody just like really hard to love that sucks the life out of me to love them. Mm. Or somebody as hard as, man, I just, every time I'm around this person, I feel like I'm just being used, right? Um, I think, why do we feel like people, why has it, or maybe the question I want to ask before we really talk about the practicalities of how we can love them. It seems like maybe there are people in our, in churches, I don't want to say in our church, I don't know, in churches that would say, 
we need to cut those people out of our lives. So mm. either forget them or distance ourselves from mm. them or, you know, ignore them, whatever it may be. Why do we, is that how a believer should respond to someone who is quote unquote toxic? And let's, let's go ahead and just uh, take, take that question where the toxic person is actually a very, unkind person right so mm. obviously if it's somebody that is just hard to be friends with maybe they're socially awkward i think that you know as believers we can easily go you know like hey you you gotta love on this brother or sister right uh but it's a difference like hey this person is just <clears throat> or mean rude yeah. or whatever right. they might they have a legitimate reason so to speak um how do we how should we approach these type of relationships with Christians? Is it right for us mm. to ignore them or distance themselves from them? Or mm. just any thoughts about that? Well, I, I think that it's, it's important that we distinguish whether or not they're Christian. Uh, and so, but you said with Christians, right? And so I think um, one of the great unifiers that we have as followers of Christ is the scriptures, right? Mm. And so if you're a jerk, the scriptures say it's not cool to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a bully, if you're a manipulator, if you're slander or gossip, if you're argumentative, these are things that the scriptures say we're not supposed to be like, right? Yeah. And so I think that what happens a lot of times is, uh, especially in light of the subject, the subjectivity of, of truth and and uh, our our dislike for conflict, I think what happens is we just don't help those people mm. um, and we end up like ignoring them or have nothing to do with them. When what we should do, I think first, obviously is you pray and you check your own heart to make sure you're not contributing to this, but ultimately those people need to be talked to. Mm -hmm. um, we need to go up to them and say, look, man, I, I've, I just wanna let you know that your argumentative nature um, is not good. You know, here's the scripture that says that, and I love you, and how can I help you with that? Yeah. Uh, we have to have the courage to love them enough to do that. There's a great verse that says, the wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the enemy is going to kiss your butt left and right, try to make you happy, right? But the friend is going to help you, is going to edify you and build you up. Mm. I think you go to those people and you just say, look, here's the problem, because they may not know. They might be so assertive that they don't understand it. They're being aggressive. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had people who have talked to me about that, um, who have said, Maddie, you know, you need to back off a little bit. I'm a little intimidated. And it, mm. you know, and it, and it doesn't help that I'm 6'5 and 300 pounds, <laughs> right? So if you hadn't have done that, then I would never have known to mm. soften up or to back off a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that that's the kind of the first step is that you, you gotta say something. You can't just, especially if you can't cover it in grace. Mm. I mean, there's certain people who I know are just a certain way and it doesn't bother me. It may bother other people, but if it bothers me, I gotta say something. Mm. I gotta say something in a way that honors God, that shows them that I love them. It's like that same people don't care how much you know until yeah. they know how much you care. Yeah. And uh, I got to say something. I can't just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think going, you know, kind of, sh should we even do anything with these toxic people? Should we leave or should we approach them? Uh, I like, the unifying factor, like you said, Pastor Mandy, is scripture. You know, we're going through Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, and, and I'm preparing for a message on on kind of fasting and, and treasure, but I'm looking at the, the whole spectrum, the bigger picture, and it, everything I see is there's a reward. There's a reward. There's a reward. And uh, this is kind of before Jesus died on the cross, obviously. So technically, it's still Old Testament stuff, right? And so you do these things and you get a reward. But we're living in a New Testament era where we already have the greatest reward of all, and that's Jesus Christ who died for the most toxic of people. Let's be honest, mm. us. We're sinners. We are the sinners. We're toxic. And, and yet, uh, and, and that's why God could not, we can't even be in his presence. But instead, uh, 
and, and the punishment is death. But then what, is, what does God do? He sends his only son, right? The one he loves and cherishes to die on a cross for the toxic, for the sinner, right? And so, um, and so you know, that, that's for those who believe in Jesus Christ, our reward is, is relationship with God. Our reward is, 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 is having communion with Jesus Christ. And, and out of that relationship, my gosh, and recognizing what God has done, that should motivate us to do the same, right? right? To love the enemy, to love the toxic, however way you want to see it. Yeah, it's a mandate. Absolutely, it's a mandate. And it, it, whether it's you funny. like it or not. <laughs> I know. And, yeah. and it's funny because a lot of times loving actions don't feel loving to the person yep. who you're trying to love. Yep. So, yep. you know, it's about, hey, man, you, you have to stop talking such trash on Facebook about so-and-so or on whatever. You got to stop it. And there even comes a time when the beautifully redemptive process of church discipline may need to come in. Yeah. You know, we, don't, we should not be afraid of, of redemptive biblical church discipline. If someone mm. is being such a jerk that it's hurting uh, the body, if they're being so toxic, we got to say something. That's yeah. Jesus's words himself. And, and, and if they don't ultimately respond uh, to church discipline, there's something you got to deal with them. And, and I, I remember working specifically for years with an individual who was so toxic. This dude mm. was divisive. He was mean spirited. He was a gossip. Uh, he was uh, in a position of influence. Hmm. And eventually it just got to the place where, you know, I think of Titus 3.10, it says, warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Hmm. It's like, look, bro, I, I love you. I've tried to bear your burdens in this. Um, you are truly toxic. This isn't just about me not liking your personality. And if you're not willing to stop biting the sheep, the other sheep, then you got to go. Yeah. You know, it's that old joke, wolf have uh, fangs, but teeth have, you know, little, uh, sheep have little teeth. They can gnaw. They just gnaw at you, gnaw at you, right? And so, mm. and especially as pastors, our yeah. job is to protect the flock. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that means from the flock itself. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, <clears throat> first, we need to check our own heart, our own motives, and where we're at. And I love what Pastor Chris was saying, that uh, we need to realize that uh, sin is toxic and we are sinners. And yeah. uh, we cannot be, we, uh, it's easy for us to minimize our sin while exaggerating someone else's sin. Mm. And I think that first thing is looking in the mirror and looking at ourselves and saying, man, uh, am I right with God? I think the second thing also what I'm hearing as well is that how do you deal with people who are toxic in the church? There has to be church discipline. There has to mm. be rebuke and it has to be done in love and in and, and, and tenderness and gentleness. And it's, it's oftentimes that we really mess up on that because we either lay down the hammer with you know, no gentleness at all or we just yep. completely avoid it. And I think those are both like really... Uh, timely reminders because I know that uh, the things that were so influential and so helpful in my own life is when people sat me down and said, Dennis, I love you, but when you did this or when you said that, that wasn't, that wasn't cool. Mm. And those are the times that forces me to slow down and kind of look in the mirror. I'm like, oh man, you're right. Mm -hmm. I need to ask for forgiveness. And I think we can do a great disservice to people who are quote unquote toxic in the church who, who, are, who proclaim themselves as Christian and, and not do anything about it, but actually gossip about them. And I think that's the thing that we see a lot, right? We want to talk yeah. to our friends about what that other oh, person yeah. is instead of talking to that person. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the flip side, if there are quote unquote toxic people who are not believers, how much more so do we need to lean in and love on that person and yeah. care for them? And so I think we would, I, it sounds like we would all reject that uh, the, the natural impulse of a, of a Christian towards someone who is uncomfortable to be around or even just detrimental to be around 
is to actually dive into that person's life yeah. in grace and mercy, not run from them because we ourselves are grounded in Christ. Our, our identity is in Christ and we know that we are his and, um, and we want to be able to portray that love to that person, whether it's for, whether that person is truly living in sin. Let's, let's not put labels on it, right? Mm-hmm. Those who are <laughs> there, if you're quote unquote toxic, you're, you're living in, in a type of sin that is relational, relationally uh, destructive to those around you. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the best thing the church can do and you can do is, is love on them sh- mm. and open up scripture and, and listen to them. Uh, I, we don't know, right? We don't know what happened in their, not, we, we don't ever want to like uh, justify their sins, but like, we don't know what happened in their lives before to. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I, I think that there is a place though, you know, when you look at Proverbs and it talks about, um, you know, not hanging out with fools mm. and, uh, and uh, bad character corrupts good company and those types of things. There is a place where after you have obeyed the scriptures and you have um, in good conscience uh, tried to, to be a blessing to this individual, there is a place where you just say, look, I'm going to have to love you at a distance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. There's mm-hmm. been plenty of people in my life who who I've tried to be redemptive. I've tried to have that relationship, but because of either my blind spots or their unwillingness to change, I have had to decide that this person isn't healthy for me to be around. It doesn't mean that I hate them. I love them desperately, um, but I'm going to have to get some space there. I, I can't have them uh, in my scope of influence because they, they are, they're hurtful. And like a dog returns to his vomit, vomit so full returns to folly, and I'm not, I'm not going back there. Yeah, and that's a perfect segue to kind of wrapping up this question. What are some practical ways we can instead love them? And I think you hit on one of the first points before we can even talk about the practical steps is that there has to be boundaries. There's just uh, that reality. Mm. Uh, boundaries are not bad. Uh, boundaries yeah. doesn't mean it's unloving. Um, Oh, no, I can't. I, I, the the verse slipped my mind, but there is that understanding that we we need to love and correct our brothers, but make sure that we. I think it was in Galatians, right? That that we are not uh, led to sin ourselves. So there is definitely some wisdom in that as well. So with that, kind of like let's move. What are some practical things we can do? We're not called to do everything, but I think as believers, we are called to do something. Or at least, uh, how can you help the believer pray through what, what should I do? Right? Mm-hmm. Trying to figure out what is the appropriate thing to do. You yeah, know what I you think? know. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pastor. All right, Chris, you go. Oh, no, I was just saying, you know, I, I love Pastor Manny, what you said about love. That doesn't necessarily mean, um, you, you know, it looks a little different. I think when whoever's asking this question is assuming that we love them means that we need to always be in their presence or somehow reach out constantly, regardless of whether they're talking. That, that's not true. You know, and I think um, scriptures are pretty clear, especially when confrontation arises uh, with sin and you bring, you know, you confront them, then you bring another person if they're not repentant, and then you bring the church if they're not repentant. If not, Jesus says, let them go. And then let the spirit do a work in their life. And then uh, they may come back. And I think that's what love at a distance perhaps means sometimes after you've done a- as much as you can to address these issues um, is sometimes uh, love is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in their life and having us have an open mind and an open heart to see uh, forgiveness and, and redemption and the Holy Spirit work in their life. And you never know, they might come back around. <laughs> you just that, never know, right? Like That picture that I see is that when somebody is in sin, and especially in such a relational way, they have distanced themselves from everybody else, right? Mm. They have distanced themselves from the church. And the picture I'm seeing of what church discipline looks like is in, in trying, to, trying to reconcile and bring this person back is that church is going to them, calling them out, pleading before them, asking them to repent. Mm. And then if they're choosing not to do anything about it, the church returns back 
to where they are at because they're the one that left, right? right. It's, not the, it's not like the church has distance from you. You have distance from the church. The church has mm. gone and sought you out. Right. But if you choose to stay there, the church comes back, but the door's always open. Like we're never going to lock the door, right? It's like, it's like the, the, the light's still on for you if you ever yeah. want to return. Yeah. But there's going to yeah. be a season where we will have to return. And you just yeah. have to decide for yourself if you feel like this is where you want to be. Yeah. Is that kind of like a, maybe a, a picture that might encapsulate what we're talking about? Yeah, I think so. You, you know, it's that thing where understanding about, you know, back to boundaries and understanding how God wants to use us redemptively is such an important aspect of, of our life. And, um, you know, as, as we think about this, I'm, tonight I'm going to be teaching on sins of the fathers you know, family systems, and mm. a lot of times people are toxic. It's very important for me to assume the best of people that I struggle mm. with. Yes. And so if someone is just a loud mouth jerk, it's, it's always important for me to understand that there could be reasons why someone would yeah. become a loud mouth yes. jerk. Maybe yes. they were ignored. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe they never, I mean, so, so, have some some grace with them in that process and then that enables the confrontation and the the boundaries that may need to be set after that um <clears throat> you know there just there just comes a time when you just have to say something and remember god works all things for the good of those who love him which means toxic people are used for good um i learn more about myself uh through working with toxic people than almost anybody else <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> i remember i was working with a guy once who was really aloof which is his personality type that's not toxic but today that would be called toxic because right? mm. i disagreed with it and i remember thinking why do i have such a problem with aloof people and it's just well ultimately because they're not impressed by me <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Good, Maddie. You're a people wow. pleaser. And although I, I'm not best friends with this guy, it's just like that was something that God used to teach me something about myself that I never knew. Mm. Um, you know, one thing I did want to mention is that a lot of times toxic people hurt us desperately and we have a hard time forgiving them. Mm. Mm, sure. And just remember that forgiveness doesn't mean like, you're cool. That's reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness just means like I'm not going to hold their their sin against them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And 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 like Ken Sandy said, you know, unforgiveness is the poison we drink, hoping someone else dies. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's just like, look, this toxic person has riddled me over the past month or my whole life with these mm -hmm. wounds. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, and. Um, we're going to have to fix this or we're going to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think another, another practical tip when it comes to, to loving the toxic is um, the way in which you, you confront the individual. And I think it's important, right? I think in our generation today, we're so quick to label people toxic mm. really quick. We don't even confront them. Just, they hurt me. They're toxic. They keep hurting me. They're toxic. Well, the problem is you probably never even brought it up to the individual in the first place, right? <laughs> and so, right. right? And so, so, um, and that's why I like what, what Pastor Maddie said, you know, um, uh, bring it to their attention, right? Bring it, bring it to mind to that individual. Hey, you've, you know, I, I want to love you. There's, you know, we're united under Christ, but this, the situation's happening. We need to, we need to rectify this. Um, but I think it, the way in which you confront someone who you have labeled as toxic no, number one, give them the benefit of the doubt, right? We all talked about okay. that. Give them the benefit of the doubt that the individual is not intentionally doing that. Enter that conversation. And then the way you do it with love, at least for me, if I was a toxic individual to someone else uh, or needed to be confronted, uh, take me out to eat, you know, one-on-one -on -one <laughs> is really good. Um, what I think the worst thing that I've seen is when people call out other people like in public. Well, that's such a toxic subtly, thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Right. right. You, you call them out and you say, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. Uh, just in public, in front of peers, in front of, mm -hmm. you know, wh whoever it may be. Um, and, th and that that's part of gossip. Right. 
Um, and so, you know, take them aside, right? Take them out to a meal, care for them, show them that you love and you care for their well-being, and then bring it up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I found that to be some of the most, uh, especially for all of us, we're in Asian circles, food is, is key. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> food is, <laughs> and so, you know, do, do it around the table, right? Um, is, yeah. is a really good way, yeah. The practice That's a good word. I had a guy, uh, an old timer who was in my Bible, one of my Bible studies, and I had said a word that we say regularly, but to him, it was a swear word. Mm -hmm. And so the next morning he showed up at my house and he was like falling over himself, telling me that he loves me and he appreciates mm -hmm. me and was sincere. And literally after 10 minutes, I'm like, if you got something to say, brother, I love you. I know you love me. Say it. And he said it. And I was like, I didn't know that. I will not say that again. Yeah. I, I love you. I don't want to be a stumbling block to you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, just come at people. I, I was doing church discipline uh, with someone, and it had gone all the way through the elders. And this individual was spreading heresy at our church. And I knew him for years and years, and he just wouldn't back down. <clears throat> and so the day that um, I was going to have to tell him, look, it's over. You got to go. Um, I, I made him, him and I both really love, um, like, um, linguine with clam sauce and fresh <laughs> clams and mussels from Ranch oh, 99. Gosh. <laughs> and so I went and I bought this, this huge meal, linguine and clam sauce from the nice wine cream sauce and I invited him to the church and we cooked together. And then after we got to meet and I said, no, I need to say something hard to you. And he goes, yeah, I'm not going to make you do it. I know what you're going to say. I'll leave. Mm -hmm. And it was just his, he, he knew that I loved him desperately. And it broke my heart to do this. Mm. Um, and yet it still had to be done. Mm. And yeah, yeah that's wow. Well, yeah. Um, I think, I think uh, just to reiterate a few of the things. Um, first, we want to give people the benefit of the doubt and have them be able to tell their story. And I think it's so quick for us to judge somebody else, judge their motives, and construct a narrative that just fits the reason why we can respond in that way, which actually makes us pretty toxic people. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, very uh, much. And, and I think there is, there is a, a grace and a mercy in hearing someone's story and what has happened to them. That, will, that obviously we all know as believers that never excuses someone's sinful action, but it helps us relate to them and empathize with their struggles. Mm. And I think there's like the step one. I think the second one that I'm hearing is that we need to lead with kindness kindness and gentleness has to go first and that's the hard work it is easy to just call somebody out and just say your piece and leave it is much more difficult to spend the hours trying to persuade and love and woo somebody back into mm. repentance and and oftentimes um we prefer to take the easy way out meaning that we actually and we might not think this but the way we approach it is saying that you're not worth my time. I don't actually love you that much. You just bother me. So I'm choosing to respond in this way. Uh, I've always learned, and, and, and I'm, I'm saying this as someone that has made this mistake in the past as a pastor, which makes me a terrible pastor, that mm -hmm. I have criticized people in public, right? But I've learned, always compliment in public, always criticize yeah. in private. Yeah. Always compliment in public, always criticize in private. And I, I learned the hard way. Because why did I do that? Cause I was impatient. I was mm. unloving and I, I was just a jerk and, and I can, I can excuse it by saying, well, this person did this, this, and this, and this, but the reality is um, toxic people don't always don't necessarily make you toxic. They just draw the toxicity, toxicity, toxicity out of yourself. Right? <laughs> it was already there. It's like when people say I'm a patient person, but you make, you don't make me patient. It's like, no, dude, you're not patient. Right? Like the only reason you know your patient is when your patient is tested. And you're telling me that mm -hmm. once your patient is tested, it falls apart. You're not patient. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> and so that's the same thing, yeah. right? It's like, yeah. oh, no, I'm a really nice person, but you make me mean. No, you just never been tested. Your kindness yeah. is never tested. 
right? And so I think there's just like something really important in that as well, yeah. that we need to lead with kindness and gentleness and love. And that's hard. And I'm pretty sure all of us have sat in yeah. rooms spending hours. Like I could have had this conversation in five minutes, but it's like a three plus hour conversation trying yeah. to get this person to see the error of their ways. Mm -hmm. And that's much more difficult than just going, hey, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. Boom, peace, right? Now you get out. Like, not, like the, it's always harder the other way. And I think the last thing that we've kind of talked about is in all of this, it doesn't mean that we have to do the hard work or right? we keep on talking about, we keep on going back to the church. So all of this is done in community, mm -hmm. right? And, and we're talking specifically about a, in a believer. And I think that's kind of the people that we have in mind because I think with non-believers, uh, it's a lot different because they don't know who Christ is and you need to approach that in a much different way with love, compassion, mercy, care, and you just double down on love every time they double down on their hurts. And, but at the same time, right? I mean, we, when it comes to a believer, it's done in community and you don't have to do everything. And I think that's yeah. where that boundary comes in, right? You don't have to be the one that quote unquote saves that person. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes it's okay to tap out and have somebody intervene but don't ever let that person go on their own mm -hmm. and i think there is times of like man, I, 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 this is just i need i need i need another brother or another sister to come alongside me and help me here because yeah. it's hard to love on my own and we should never do that on our own um any last words from any last words last thoughts before we kind of wrap this up yeah you know uh, um i just was thinking how tenderness, kindness, love. I think most of us know that, but the thing that I don't think we know is that it takes courage. Mm. It really, especially if you're in a culture that doesn't really put a high view on conflict. Mm. Um, you know, for my people here in the Japanese culture, conflict, they see it very differently from uh, American culture. And so I have to really understand that it takes so much courage for them to do that yeah and so that's that kind of redemptive god i'm gonna do this it's walking by faith other people it's easy but for me it's tough it takes that courage to do it but man if jesus did it for me how could i not do it for them yep man you know, uh, I think for me, um, the word that comes to mind when it comes to courage is we live in a generation that doesn't have courage because it's too easy to block or what we say cut out toxic. And I think the last thing that I, I wanted to say is uh, I'd like that taken out of our vocabulary, regardless of whether we let them go out of love. Uh, this idea of cut out means they're never going to come back. Mm. Right. But we need to allow for room. That's love. Allow for room for them to come back just because we once viewed them as toxic doesn't mean that they god does a work in them and they come back and they're different mm -hmm. and yet we still see them with the lens of toxic mm -hmm. you got to take that off you got to you know once you let them you got to you got to you know allow that forgiveness to work as well you know and so and to welcome them back and to begin anew that relationship that was once broken right and so um, yeah, have, a, have an open heart, an open mind. And, and I guess the heart of the issue when it comes to love is long for and hope for the day that you actually get to see them again, face to face and, and, and reconcile, mm -hmm. right? And, and hopefully on earth, but if not, God willing, if they're a Christian, you'll be united uh, in the kingdom of God and long for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, last thing is that we don't ever, we should as believers never minimize our sin. Uh, if Paul can say and with all confidence and uh, you know, he's not just saying for the sake of saying that he's the chief of all sinners, mm -hmm. I think there's something that we can learn from that, that uh, the, what's, what's wrong with the world is me. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to come with that humility, you know, yeah. the, uh, removing the plank out of our own eye before we try to remove the speck of our brother's eye. And I think there's something to be said there in a culture that uh, wants to point fingers that we as believers should always point to ourselves first by saying, there is something that I need to change and something I need to repent of before we move forward. Uh, that's all the time we have this week. Uh, I'm pretty sure if y'all made it all the way 
to, uh, to hear. Thank you for, for kind of uh, staying with us. I'm pretty sure you don't like it when, I, <laughs> when I'm the one moderating because we always go along. But thank you so much for Pat, uh, Pastor and Maddie for joining us. And I want You're to, welcome. Uh, Praise uh, God. And I want to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in and supporting us with this podcast. So uh, keep on submitting your questions to us. We are reading them. We want to answer them all. Uh, obviously, when you start going one week at a time and we have, you know, 20, 30 plus questions, it's going to take a long time. And some of the questions might, you know, might be a little bit more difficult to answer. We'll um, do seasons. That, seasons yeah, we'll, right? we'll try our best to try to get them. <laughs> We're lumping them together. We're doing all things, everything we can. And, um, we have a great lineup coming up, and so next week it should be Pastor Eddie. I think we're going to confirm that, and we're going to talk about, a little bit about family. And we'll also have uh, another pastor, Pastor Andrew Ong, who uh, was the speaker for uh, our Young Adult Fellowship, LSF. Um, and so there will be more pastors coming your way that you would recognize, but you will also bring some people that you might not recognize as well, trying to introduce you to some people and new people. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, just continue sending those questions. We love y'all. Bye.